Hello and welcome to Physics 1403, Stars and Galaxies. In the previous video, we talked about our planetary neighborhood, Earth, Moon, the Sun, and the planets, asteroids, the Kuiper Belt. And today we're going to look at uh, the universe at a larger scale. So we're going to start with uh, where our Sun is in the uh, group of stars which we call a galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, and then the local group that the Milky Way is a part of, and then the cluster, galaxy clusters, larger than um, uh, the local group, and then super clusters, and maybe the whole observable universe. Now, um, our sun is a star, okay? so. A star, as you remember from the first lecture, is a mainly hydrogen, made of hydrogen. There is a nuclear fusion process which converts hydrogen into helium. And in the process, uh, we give energy. We get energy from the star. So, a star has a life cycle based on this process the thing the force that keeps the molecules together is gravity actually if you look at the beginnings of a star formation it starts with um, gas so let's say stars the first thing we can talk about star is the evolution of stars that includes birth of a star birth from gas cloud under the influence of gravity huge amounts of uh, helium atoms under the pressure and heat start uh, producing this nuclear fusion uh, energy that's how a star is born and uh, the burning of the fuel uh, if you will lasts for billions of years and our star uh, Sun has another maybe four or five billion years to go before it runs out of fuel and then uh, goes through the final stages of the evolution of stars. Now that depends on other parameters of course meaning uh, how this life ends. Some stars, the big ones, end with a huge explosion all right, which we call a, a supernova supernova explosion it's an explosion and uh, most of the material in the star is thrown out and um, sometimes what remains is just a uh, dwarf star uh, a neutron star or even a black hole Now, these are the possibilities uh, after a uh, explosion. Sometimes you'll have a supernova, but the star, star simply dies off to a dim um, star. We have uh, red dwarfs, okay? They're not even visible to the naked eye, but that's the final stage. Um, what, there are white dwarfs, etc. Uh, and after the explosion, out of that material, which is uh, ejected and through the interstellar medium may become part of uh, that gas cloud I was telling you about and it may result in another star okay so one star dies giving birth to another star kind of recycling the material all right so uh, what are other things that need to be uh, discussed regarding stars we're not going to do all of this today but let's just an introduction uh, the size of the stars. Size. Now, Sun is a medium sized star. Uh, remember the uh, size and mass, let's say. Mass. These two are important. And speaking of uh, mass, the stars that actually go through a supernova explosion that are the massive stars and their lives are shorter than smaller stars, okay? 
greater the mass, shorter the lifespan of the star. So we're talking about maybe a hundred times a solar mass, M. Remember the symbol? This means sun. So that's the mass of the sun. So if you remember from last lecture, the mass of the sun is 2 times 10 to the power 30 30th kilograms. Uh, similarly, you know, we may have uh, a tenth of our sun, okay? So size and mass uh, vary a lot. What else? Uh, brightness. Brightness is an important factor. Brightness. And also uh, color of the star. Now color tells a lot about the temperature of the star. All right? Color gives clues about the temperature of the star. Is it a yellowish bright or bluish? You know, uh, that tells how hot the star is. And brightness, remember brightness um, is a relative, can be a relative uh, measure. I mean, the sun obviously looks the bright as the brightest star in the sky because that's very close to the star. Now imagine you see some other place, you see two stars with uh, relatively you know, similar brightnesses, but one of them could be maybe 10 times uh, at a greater distance, farther away. Okay, So there's absolute brightness and then relative brightness. These are the things we have to consider later, but keep in mind. Now, okay? So evolution of the stars, lifespan, Short-lived stars, long-lived stars. Some short-lived stars could be 300 million years. So the life span could be 300 million years. Or it could be 10 billion years. Okay, smaller stars live longer. Okay, evolution and lifespan, size and mass, and brightness and color. So, uh, let's start with our sun. So where is the sun? Sun is part of a galaxy called Milky Way. Now we are inside the Milky Way, so we don't have a chance to look at it from outside. But we see other galaxies uh, in the sky, and these were dis discovered in 1920s and 30s. And it is estimated that in the observable units there are maybe 200 billion galaxies. 200 billion galaxies. Okay? I mean, it may look like a dot in the sky, but that dot contains 200 or 400 billion stars. So each galaxy, each galaxy contains roughly, let's say, 100 billion stars, more or less, like our galaxy Milky Way. It is estimated that uh, there are 200 to 400 uh, billion galaxies, a billion stars. Maximum estimation, 400 billion stars. Maybe also that many planets, therefore, like those stars will have their planetary systems, right? So that many uh, stars in the sky in the observable universe, but let's just focus on the Milky Way right now. Uh, I was talking about the, the shape of the Milky Way galaxy. We cannot look at the Milky Way from outside, but we see other galaxies in the sky, and we make comparisons, and we know that our galaxy has a peculiar shape, okay? It's got spiral arms, so it's got a really bright galactic center, I imagine if you could look at the uh, galaxy from outside, from above or below, depending on what angle you're looking at, 
a galactic center, which is really massive and bright. Bright means the stars are all packed together. And then you have spiral arms around that galactic center. Okay, so they may look like this. Okay, I'm not a good artist, but uh, pretty much you may end up with uh, at least four spiral arms. And the stars themselves are right where those arms are, okay? So that's roughly the shape of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Milky Way, and where is the sun, if that's the galaxy? Let's say sun is somewhere around here, okay? One of those arms. Well, these arms have names, but it doesn't matter what they're called right now. And the stars, when they go around the galactic center, they never complete a loop, a complete circle. They go in and out of these arms, okay? There are oscillations. It's a complicated topic, but for now, let's say uh, st our star, sun, is right here okay let's talk about the size here uh, if the galactic center is right there our sun is right here okay let this be the distance uh, between the galactic center and our sun sun call it uh, d okay and then of course we have the diameter of the galaxy itself Okay, let's call it, uh, well, we already used the letter D. Let's use small d for the galaxy. Doesn't matter what letter you use. Now, such distances are huge, okay? Now, to give you an idea, uh, the sun completes one cycle around the galactic center in 240,000... I'm sorry, million years, 240 million years, right, which is called a galactic year for the sun, of course, for another star at the different arm, it will be a different number, galactic, uh, one galactic year is the time com to complete one cycle around the sun, that's 240 million years all right so think about it uh, the last huge extinction event which ended the dinosaurs right was only 66 million years ago so suppose uh, the rotation direction is this of the sun around the uh, galactic center and the sun supposedly, you know, goes around a circle or ellipse like that. So if it's the sun today, right there, okay, 66 million years ago, the sun would be only here, right? About one third. That's when the dinosaurs were extinct, all right? We haven't even completed one cycle since then. So, and the sun's uh, speed around the around the galactic center is huge, okay? In one second, you go like 200 kilometers, okay? That fast, if I'm not mistaken. So the distances are really big. So we need to come up with a way to determine distances. Well, first of all, how do we know how far these stars are? That's one thing to consider, okay? So let's say, how do we measure these distances, what are the methods, okay? And then what are the units of measurement? Units of uh, distances, distances. Now, so far we've seen, well, of course, meters, kilometers, and then we've seen the astronomical unit, AU, that was the distance between the sun and the earth which changes throughout the year, but you can either consider the average or you can just define, okay? Define.
Now this is roughly 149 million kilometers. 149 million kilometers. The capital M stands for million. Okay, six zeros or one times 10 to the power six. So you are already familiar with this unit, the distance between sun and the earth. Now what other units uh, are used in astronomy? Uh, I'm sure you've heard about uh, light year. Light year. Light year is the distance light travels in one year. All right? So light year is not a unit for time, okay? I mean, there's a year in the name, but it's not a unit for time. It's a unit for distance. One light year. And why do we use light year? Because the speed of light is a constant of nature in all directions and in all reference frames the speed of light is the same okay we can talk about it um, later in the semester why that is the case or how do we know and etc but for now let's just keep in mind that uh, the light year is the distance light travels in one year one earth year okay of course, you can define the year in different ways, and uh, the Julian year is 365.25 days, okay, and the speed of light is a constant, it's roughly uh, 300,000 Uh, kilometers per seconds or in uh, scientific notation you write it as three times ten to the power eight okay kilo kilo means one thousand right so one thousand meters times three hundred thousand equals three times ten to the power eight there are eight zeros next to three meters per seconds that's the number which you can easily use but the exact number is two hundred and ninety nine million uh, seven nine two four five eight if I'm not mistaken so that's how many meters it travels in one second all right so in order to find the light year light year in meters so how many meters are there in one light year we have to use a very simple formula the distance traveled is the speed times time right that's I mean true for any kind of uh, constant velocity uh, motion uh, let me check if it's still recording by the way uh, sometimes just okay it is recording right so speed times time gives you distance all right so how many meters are there in one light year let's find that it's really easy so one I'm gonna use LY for light year one light year so that's the distance I'm just gonna write speed here 299 792 and 458 meters per second this times one year okay so one year is 365.25 days but that's not enough because I have seconds here. I have days there. I have, to, I have to convert it to seconds, right? So I need conversion factors, basically. Let's start with hour. So one day we know is 24 hours. And in one hour, we have 60 minutes. And uh, in one minute, we have how many 60 seconds all right so you can now get rid of days hours they cancel minutes also go away and the seconds go away as well right and what is left meters so one light year is how many meters we have to do this calculation just multiply these numbers 299 million seven hundred and ninety two thousand 458 I forgot an eight here sorry 458 
58, 458 times 365.25 times 24 times 60 times 60, 3600. Okay, that's 9.46. Times 10 to the power 15 meters. All right, meters. If you want to write it in terms of kilometers, that is 9.46 times 10 to the power 12 kilometers. Remember, kilo means 1,000, mega means. 1 million, let's list, the, list these, 1 kilo means 1,000. 1 mega stands for 1 million, all right? Now 1 giga is going to be, okay, let's also use scientific notation, 1 times 10 to the power 3, 1 times 10 to the 6, that would be mega. Giga means 1 times 10 to the 9th, right? That's what a billion is billion and M stands for million and this stands for thousand of course kilo and what else uh, Terra 1T capital T like terabyte hard disk you know uh, 1 times 10 to the power 12 so that means trillion so what we have here is approximately 10 trillion, 10 trillion meters, kilometers, I'm sorry, 10 trillion kilometers, okay, and that's what one light year is. All right, um, now what about the uh, astronomical unit here, 149 million kilometers, can we use the same equation here to determine uh, let's say the time for sunlight to reach us all right i'm sure you've done this calculation calculation before sometime in the past so time would be according to that distance over speed okay c c stands for speed of light speed of light in physics speed is usually uh, the letter V which comes from velocity right but when it is light we use the letter C to some convention so if you take uh, the distance between Earth and the Sun that's one astronomical unit so 149 this number is not exact uh, I'm just gonna round it to 149 million um, kilometers right so 149 million kilometers which means this many meters all right speed so let's use that speed again 299792 458 meters per second meters will cancel and this will give us the time in seconds so 149 to the power how many zeros nine to the power nine divided by 299 792 458 this gives me 497 roughly not exact because uh, the astronomical unit is not this number but I'm just rounded off to uh, 149 this many seconds and how many seconds are there in one minute 60 so this times uh, one minute over 60 seconds so divide this number by 60 8.28 minutes So it takes about eight minutes for the sunlight to reach us from sun to earth. How long would it take 
to go from one side of the Milky Way to the other side. Okay, that's why we introduced this. You know? So in other words, what is the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy in terms of light years? It takes more than eight minutes, obviously, more than a year. Okay, now the historically, it was thought that D was around a hundred thousand. Okay, so let's give us the number here. D was thought to be 100,000 light years diameter, which means the radius is half of that, of course. And then um, recent um, measurements actually uh, were even higher, um, around uh, 150 to 180 um, thousand, 180,000 light years. That's just the bright part. What about the part that we cannot see? All right. Now, this is a topic by itself, and um, it's called dark matter. Dark matter. Dark matter is some matter with mass, some galactic material with mass, but we cannot see it. All right, so it doesn't emit light, it doesn't reflect light, it doesn't interact with light at all. So we cannot detect it just by looking at it, either with naked eye or with some special filters, you know, telescope. We cannot. And how, why do we think? there is such matter in the universe, particularly in the galaxy. Well, it interacts with the rest of the galaxy, rest of the stars, through gravity. Gravity, okay? So this is a problem that has to do with gravity. It's a gravitational issue. It is attracted by the other visible ordinary mass, but it doesn't interact with electromagnetic waves which is light all right but why do we need it that's what i was saying now it was uh, observed in 1930s that uh, these galaxies spin i was telling you about uh, earth uh, the sun's rotation around the galaxy right and um, normally you would ex expect uh, the speed to follow a certain um function, a function of uh, the distance from the center, okay, which is predicted by Newtonian gravity. So this has to do with the speed, rotation speed. Rotation speeds of galaxies. But when you measure that speed, you find a number which is higher than you expected. It's as if there is some mass there which holds the galaxy together and then um, when the stars go around that mass, the amount of mass there determines how fast the star is moving. So there's a relationship between the mass of the galaxy and the speed of the stars going around the galactic center. So to cut the long story short, uh, from the 1930s, the astronomers uh, knew that there was some mass missing and they call it dark dark because we can't see it also we are in the dark because we don't know what it is we don't know what it's made of there are some people who say it doesn't even exist maybe it could be true or we don't know yet but dark matter if you count dark matter it's even bigger okay so if you add dark ma dark matter into the diameter Okay, I'm going to show dark matter with, well, let's see, what color? Let's use uh, some, got a galaxy pen, okay? So some dark matter around the galaxy, like this. If you include that, this number becomes, I believe, 1.9 million light years, okay? I mean, that's debatable, but that's, those are the latest numbers or predictions. Okay, let's get bigger. 
All right, so what about the sun? How far is the sun from the galactic center? That will be the capital D. Sorry, this uh, galaxy picture is now a little bit cluttered, but remember the sun is not at the edge, not at the center, it's somewhere in between, but where is it? So the sun, this capital T, that's uh, 25, 27,000 light years away from the center. Okay, that's where the sun is. So let me draw this again. This is the spiral, which is our uh, Milky Way. By the way, of course, if you look in the night sky, we don't see Milky Way like this. Okay, I'm sure you've seen th thousands of Milky Way pictures, uh, which are gorgeous, but uh, if you were able to look at the star, the galaxy from outside, it will look like a spiral and the sun would be here. How far is it from the center? That's this number, 27,000 light years. And remember, it completes one cycle in around 240 uh, million years. All right. Now, uh, what about the direction of rotation of the galaxy? Okay, it's a spiral, okay? Um, so I think I already showed you, gave you an idea which was this, okay? This would be the rotation, direction of, direction of the revolution of the star around the galactic center. Now this is looking from above, okay? If you're looking from sideways, it looks totally different. So you would see a bulge at the center and then those spiral arms will be along that plane. So that would be the view um, sideways. I'm just talking about right on top or bottom, depending on which way you're looking at. But what direction, okay? So the arrows I put there, if you think of the rotation like this, that's uh, that you, this is the case you say the arms, spiral arms are trailing, trailing rotation. Uh, could they lead the rotation? Is it possible to have a Let's say this is your galaxy and it rotates in this direction. Is it possible? All right, this would be uh, leading arms. Leading arms. Now it turns out that most of the galaxies um, rotate the first way, like the, the trailing arm. But every once in a while you will find some galaxies which rotate the other way around, and that's because they are either colliding with other galaxies, two galaxies collide, they're about to collide, or in they're in the middle of the collision process, or they collided in the past, so somehow the motion has been affected by this collision, that's why you have this, okay? So naturally you would expect uh, trailing arms. Um, I mean, if it takes millions of years to complete one rotation, how do you even know if they're rotating or not? That could be a very uh, good question, right? So there are techniques to determine uh, the speed of celestial objects, like a star, is it coming towards us or is it going away from us? That's the first thing you can think of. Now, turns out that uh, the light that comes from the star uh, is bluish if it's coming toward us and it's reddish if it's moving away from us. I mean that's not a very good description actually. What you really have to do is to let the light go through a prism or better through a device which we call the diffraction grating. If you do that, if you separate the light, it looks like white, but if you separate it, it has some lines which have distinct colors and you know where those colors should be in the uh, spectrum spectrum means uh, finding the positions of the uh, specific colors according to the frequency or wavelength and this is kind of maybe advanced for uh, our class for right now we're gonna see it in detail later just giving you a preview right now so those colors have specific positions 
if the car, if the, not car, if the um, star is receding, it's going away from us, those colors are shifted towards red, which means longer wavelength. If the star is coming towards us, they shift towards the other side, which is blue, all right? So the, the, the colors, the visible spectrum, range from red to violet, okay? We call it the red shift if it's going away, blue shift is coming towards us. So, we just look at this uh, star, basically. You can look at the arms. Okay, I'm gonna mark two points now. Let's say this is us here, observing this, the galaxy. This is your eye, okay? And here's the galaxy. So, well, if you're just looking at the galaxy from above, it's a disk, so actually it's neither going away nor coming towards us. Well, you have to look at the galaxy, which is not which is tilted, all right? So let's say the galaxy is tilted like this. In other words, the plane of the galaxy, the rotation plane is like that, okay? So then you can decide, now if, let's say there's a clockwise rotation here. If it's a clockwise rotation, you know that uh, this point here All right, so that point is coming towards you and this star here going away from you. So this would look red, okay, this would look uh, green. But then you gotta be careful again because you just see a distorted shape, a, a disc distorted, uh, when distorted looks like an ellipse. So maybe it's looking like this. Maybe that's the orientation, you know, of the plane. It could be still a clockwise rotation, but now um, the points have shifted their color, right? So you gotta be careful. Anyways, that's maybe digressing now. Um, but when this study was made, uh, I mean, naturally you would expect half of the galaxy turned clockwise, the other half counterclockwise because they're randomly distributed so they've done many observations and they found that most of the galaxies spiral galaxies I'm talking about have a rotation where the spiral arms are just uh, trailing the rotation all right so that's true for our Milky Way also and remember stars go in and out of these uh, galactic uh, spirals what other ch shapes are present. Uh, there are some disc-shaped galaxies, uh, elliptical galaxies, there are uh, Magellanic clouds, there are many different uh, types of uh, galaxies, okay? There are some that look like hat, okay? Okay, so Milky Way, that's Milky Way, uh, with a diameter which could go up to 1.9 million light years if if dark matter is included. If you don't include dark matter, 180,000 uh, kilo light years is the latest uh, figure. I think in the book it just says 100,000 light years, which is a classical uh, estimation, okay? So there are around uh, 200 to 400 billion stars uh, in our galaxy. So which of these stars is closest to us? Okay, let's talk about that now. So this is our sun with the planets around it. But the nearest star, okay, I'm just, just a sketch here. I'm not showing you the scale to a scale picture. There is a uh, star group called Alpha Centauri, Alpha, Centauri. Now there is a, there are three stars, okay? Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Alpha Centauri C. And C is also called a uh, Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri. Now A and B are uh, binary stars. 
stars, what we call binary. A binary star system is sort of like a star and planet, but think of the planet as large as star, because it is a star, okay? So these two stars go around each other like that, okay? So Alpha Centauri A and B are relatively uh, similar in size, so they go around each other, and that's the case for many, many stars in the universe, okay? These are called binary stars. They're bright, we can see them, they rotate, and the rotation period takes maybe 59, 60 years, if I'm not mistaken. So these stars are um, 4.3 light years away, the distance from the sun, the sun through this star system is 4.3 light years. That's the closest, but the Proxima Centauri, Alpha Centauri C, is even closer. That's uh, 4.2 light years. Okay, but you cannot see Proxima Centauri with uh, naked eye. It's not bright, it's dim. This is dim, these two are bright. This is actually called a red dwarf. All right, so that's the closest star um, to Sun. To give you an idea how stars, how separate they are in the Milky Way galaxy, okay? The diameter goes to hundreds of thousands of light years, but the nearest star is at 4.2 light years. Now there is one more unit uh, when measuring large distances like this, that's called a parsec. Parsec, or PC for short. Okay, that's also a uh, distance unit. A distance unit. And this has to do with a, uh, this, remember in the beginning I said there are two aspects of the, to this. Number one, how do you measure it? How do you measure these distances anyway, right? I mean, before you can talk about units, how do you measure it? Now we're going to talk about measurement. There are methods, and one of them, which has, used, which has been used for centuries, is called the parallax method. Parallax. Parallax method, okay? Now try to, right now, look at an object in your room, okay, with one eye. So close one eye and look at the object and put your finger in front of you, okay? Like right now I'm looking at the camera here. I close my left eye and then I'm holding my finger right in front of my face. Maybe you see my finger and my face, all right? Now, suppose I wanna find the distance between my eye and the finger. I'm not gonna move anything except for I'm going to close my right eye and then look at the camera and the finger with my left eye without moving my finger, okay? So right eye versus left eye. So what you see is, in the beginning, if you do it like me, the finger was right in front of the camera when I was using my right eye. When I switched to my left eye, the camera in the background shifted a little bit to the left, so they're not at, at the same point anymore, okay? So here is uh, the beginning, number one, and here's my uh, finger, and here was the camera, camera, and then I used switched eyes, let's say, and the camera, the camera did not move actually, okay, because camera is far, my finger is closer to my eye, it's like my finger moved. So my finger moved, oops, my finger moved to the right, so. My finger moved to the right, just because I switched eyes. How much has it moved, okay? If I can determine this, I can find out how far is my finger from my eye? Now let's take this two 
a larger scale with stars. Okay, I'm talking about the parallax method, and uh, once we understand what the method is, we will know what parsec means. Okay, so we have the astronomical unit, light year. Now we have parsec as a unit. All right, so here's what we do. Instead of my finger, I'm going to find a star that I want to determine the distance of, right? So here's, uh, here's the sun, and here's the orbit of the Earth around the sun, all right? And now here is a, here's a star, okay? And I want to find out how far the star is from the sun, let's say. Now this distance I'm going to call D, but uh, D is very large compared to the astronomical unit, which is the radius of Earth's orbit, right? So the distance from the star to the sun, or the distance from the star to Earth, they're all at the same range okay so they're not too different what what I can do is this I can look at the star at a certain time of the year okay and when I pick that time of the year all I need is a right angle here so I'm gonna pick a point along the orbit let's say sometime right now we are in January okay so this is where Earth is in January all right this is right angle but I'm looking at the star, remember? This is the star here. So this is my, this is the uh, hypotenuse, right? Of that uh, triangle there. But I need something in the background, just like I had the camera in the previous example, right? So that background will be other stars, but those other stars are even farther away. So uh, when Earth is over here, in when in July or something right six months later when the earth is here so earth is here today but in six months earth will be over here when that happens those stars in the background will not move okay they have the same location in the sky meaning you know I, I know what my watch says I just go out and then look at the position of the star I have to do the measurements at certain time of the day okay otherwise I would be looking in another direction right so it has to, it has to be uh, the time that will give me that direction okay and then uh, in six months those stars would not move a lot zero okay because they're almost infinitely far away compared to the star that i'm looking at compared to this star here the stars in the background let's say there's that star here this is the background star doesn't matter what it is okay it could be anything any star but i could i should be able to see it all right so here's the line that is an extension of the other line that i just drew okay so when i look at the star here, I see that star and the star behind it. So this is what I have. I'm just going to same colors here. I have the star. This is the star I'm chasing. And then there's the blue one right behind it or something like that. But six months later, I look at the same star. But here's what I see now. I'm going to draw a line that goes from E prime to this star. But if I keep going, I don't see the original star in January. In July, I see another star here, which now is in the background, okay? In other words, um, in other words, six months later, my star is here. My old star, the background star, will be to the left six months later, six, months later all right so you see what i'm getting at now from this shift i can determine d 
the distance. How? All I know is the shift itself, the shift. Now this shift, what, how am I going to measure the shift? I'm going to measure this shift in angle units, right? Because everything around me is like a dome, okay? Speaking of uh, this plane, it's like a circle. So I'm just talking about this circle here, like that circle around me. Okay, and from the position I am, that corresponds to a very tiny triangle. Okay, so that shift being here, from here to there, corresponds to a narrow angle. And that angle is called the parallax angle, okay? So here's the deal. Um, I measure that angle, the parallax, and I know this distance here is one AU, or think about the diameter, it's two AU, it doesn't matter which one you think. Now consider this angle, for instance, call it uh, theta, and call uh, half of that angle P, P stands for parallax, okay? So you could measure these angles. How are you gonna measure? Uh, two P. Now, in geometry, if you have two parallel lines, and then an intersecting line, you know that uh, the angles, uh, for instance, this angle is equal to that, this also is equal to that, and all that stuff, right? Now, we can assume safely that um, the two lines, let's say, from E to here, and then, okay, let's give the name to this point. Let's call it, uh, what, we use the letter P, Call it V. This is the point V. Okay, so we have two lines, E prime and V, which is this. And we have E and V, E V. Now, if V is really far away, these two are almost parallel. Okay, I mean, in reality, they are not, and it's, they're definitely not parallel in my drawing, but it's because my drawing is not to scale, okay? But you can assume, as an approximation, that these are parallel. If that's the case, then uh, this is also theta. Okay, so that's how you uh, find those angles. You just measure the, the shift. Okay, so that will be a very small shift smaller than a degree okay so smaller than a degree the shift or the parallax angle parallax angle is smaller than one degree how many degrees are there in one cycle there are 360 degrees degrees the circle or the, just right degree here you take each degree and divide by 60, so 1 60th of a degree would be 1 arc minute. Arc minute is 1 60th of a degree. And 1 60th of an arc minute is what? Arc second, right? 1 arc second. Sometimes uh, you will see just uh, point oh 0.01 and you see a double apostrophe, that means arc second, okay? And for arc min minute, you use only one apostrophe or prime, okay? And for degree, you use a small circle. Anyway, so this is a small angle, okay? So you can measure those angles in arc seconds or arc minutes, maybe. And that's because of these approximations of distances uh, really far. Now, D doesn't have to be that far, but the background star is very far. So, how does the trigonometry work here? I mean, you can uh, do it like this. You can either use uh, tangent theta is equal to what? 2 AU, astronomical unit, divided by 
what the D, or you can just use P. Tangent P would be equal to 1 AU over D. I think from the graph, from the picture I drew, uh, the second one looks, makes more sense, right? Because tangent is opposite over hypotenuse, opposite side over hypotenuse. Hypotenuse being this side, and then opposite, I'm sorry, not hypotenuse, sorry, uh, adjacent. Opposite over uh, adjacent, right? Adjacent would be D, opposite would be uh, Earth Sun distance. The first equation uh, may not say, make sense, but it's true because of the uh, distances, all right? Large distances. Anyway, so from that equation, let's take this one. And let's do this. Okay, since these angles are small, since P is very small, we can use an approximation. Uh, the approximation for small arguments, I'm gonna call it X for now. Tangent X becomes X when X is measured in radians, in radians. Degrees is not the only way to measure angles, right? You can also measure angles in radians, like uh, two pi radians is what 360 degrees is. Okay, this comes basically from the circumference formula for a circle, right? So. If the radius is r, the circumference is 2 pi r. If you consider a unit circle, unit circle means uh, radius is 1, then the um, circumference is just 2 pi. Okay? Actually, you can find any arc length using this logic. So let me show like a blue. So if you have a arc here, or over here, let me show you the general formula. That corresponds to a certain angle here, theta, let's say. Uh, this arc length, S, would be simply equal to theta times R. This formula works if the angle is in radians, okay? So whenever you see those pi's, that's radians. Like, pi over two would be 90 degrees. Pi would be 180 degrees, right? So, this uh, approximation, just so that if you want to try this with your calculator, okay, try it for, uh, I don't know, 0.5 degrees. 0.5 degrees. If you just try 0.5, of course, you will not get that number if you're, okay, there are two things you have to do with your calculator, right? First of all, you have to um, set it to radians. Now, what if you did not set it to radians? What if the angle unit is in degrees? I just type here, tangent 0.5. My calculator thinks it is in degrees, okay? So I just hit answer and I get this number. Tangent 0.5 degrees is equal to, what is that? 8.73 times 10 to the negative three. Okay, that's obviously not what I'm talking about here. I want this to be equal to that, all right? So, this doesn't work with degrees, it has to be in radians to do that. So the first thing I do is just to show that tangent x is close to x, I shift from degrees to radians in my settings. The angle unit would be radians, all right? And now the second thing I do is, when I do the math, I convert degrees to radians, so tangent, 0.5 degrees. What is this in radians, basically? I need a conversion factor here. Now I can use any 360 or 180, let's use 180. So 180 degrees is uh, pi radians. Okay, so before applying tangent, I have to do this math here. So what do I do? I take 0.5 times, I multiply it by pi, oops, multiply it by pi, and then divide by 180. All right, 
So this is basically tangent of, what is that number? 8.726646 times 10 to the negative third radians. Okay. I take the tangent of this when the calculator is in the radian mode. So tangent of the answer. The answer would be equal to, I'm just copying from uh, here, 8.726868 times 10 to the negative third. Okay? So you see these are really close. I mean, check these out. To, all the way to here. And after that, it differs because it's not exact. I mean, it is uh, an approximation. Okay? But the angle has to be in radians. So I'm going to take that formula then, which is the one in the box here, tangent P equal to one astronomical unit over D. And I'm going to consider an angle in, um, let's say, arc seconds, which is very small, right? So tangent of an angle, I'm going to keep the letter P here. P will just be a number, a very small number. But the unit is arc seconds. So arc, oops, arc, arc, sec, okay? But I need to convert it to uh, radians, just like I did over here. So what do I do? First of all, from arc seconds, I go to degrees, let's say. Uh, so uh, one degree has 60 arc minutes and each minute each arc minute has 60 arc seconds so i have 30 600 arc sec in one degree and then i know there are uh, let's say 180 degrees in pi radians okay so that's tangent p that will be equal to uh, 1 AU over D. And if I use the approximation, that will be equal to 1 AU over D. All right? So this will be then equal to P. See, arc 6 go away. Degrees go away. So what is left? Pi over pi over uh, 3600 times 180 that would be 648,000 equals 1 AU over D all right so let's think of a special case special case of p equal to 1 so we're talking about a parallax shift of 1 arc seconds all right then what is d and that's the definition of a parsec then uh, d would be equal to just a solution of this equation right that would be uh, 1 AU times 648,000 divided by pi. So take this number and divide it by pi. You get 206, 2006, 1,264.8 AU. That's one parsec, okay? That's equal to one par sec. Let's think of it in terms of uh, light years. Light years, all right? So remember, one light year was around... Uh, now, I'm going to use approximations now, okay? Three uh, times 10 to the 8 
No, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the speed of light. Uh, one light year was around 10 trillion. 10 trillion. Ten trillion uh, kilometers. Okay. Now one parsec or PC is this many astronomical units. So two oh six two six four point eight. Okay. I'm using an approximation, but okay. Times AU. A unit is AU. Multiplied by a conversion factor. Now one AU is what 149,000 um, um, uh, 149 million uh, kilometers, right? So times 10 to the 6 kilometers. And finally, one more conversion factor here uh, 10 trillion kilometers which means 10 to the power, what, 15, right? 9 means billion. Uh, 12, I'm sorry, 12, uh, 10 to the power, 12. Uh, is a trillion, all right? 10 times 10 to the power, 12 kilometers. That is what one light year is. So again, AUs cancel, kilometers cancel, and if I didn't mess this up, now I know what, how many light years there are in one parsec, okay? So let's do the math, 206, 264, okay? That times 149, this will be approximately, of course, 149. Now, you can also simplify this. Uh, six, this cancels that, which makes 10 to the six. So 149 divided by 10 times 10 to the power 6. Okay. So 3.07, 3.07 light years. Okay. I just want to confirm this number because uh, I can't remember the exact. So let me just look it up real soon quick uh, real quick so let's say one parsec in right years uh, 3.26 so the exact number is 3.26 let me go back here exact number from professor Google is 3.26 light years now, why is it a little bit different from what I did? That's because I used the astronomical unit as uh, 149 million kilometers. It's not exact, okay? The definition, if you look it up, is actually a bit more than that. So that's why my parsec was a little bit shorter than the actual parsec, okay? So roughly three, okay? Three light years is one parsec. All right, so... Milky Way's uh, diameter could be from uh, 33,000 uh, parsecs to, you know, uh, up to uh, uh, 120 or something parsecs. Okay, so that's the definition of parsec, and the definition comes from the definition of the method, which is called the parallax method, okay? And the parallax is used, has been used for um, centuries. The first time they used it was to, to find the distance of the moon from the Earth, right? And later uh, you could measure the planets, Venus, and all that, okay? So it's a very good method. And there are times where you need other methods to determine the distances as well. But for now, let's just uh, leave it there. So, Milky Way. Okay, we're done with Milky Way. And is that the end of the story? No, there's a lot more. Okay, so Milky Way is our galaxy. Turns out that there are other galaxies close to ours. Okay, so here's the Milky Way. 
Milky Way is a four hundred uh, uh, billion stars. A lot of a lot of mass. So we also have some satellite galaxies around us. Okay, well, satellite, satellite stars and so it's like a like a group. Okay, but uh, there's another group of galaxies called the Andromeda. Andromeda. Okay, and the catalog name is M31. And there's another one called M33 next to it. And this is kind of like Milky Way, okay? Very massive. Actually, Andromeda is mass, more massive than the Milky Way. All right, but they're all the spirals, okay? So there are also some satellite galaxies around it. And um, it's coming towards us, okay? This Andromeda. The M here stands for Messier named after an astronomer, Messier type of galaxy, okay? But the Milky Way and Andromeda are on a collision course, okay? They're gonna collide in the future. So when they collide, the sun will be also thrown out from its orbit, okay? We don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, there are simulations you can find on the internet. They're fun. So if you're gonna merge and form some a super galaxy and then some parts will fly off and then come back but well, this will take millions and millions of years of course all right and uh, there's another large group uh, over here called the uh, tri triangulum triangle I think I spelled it uh, incorrectly but I think uh, that's also an elliptical I'm sorry uh, spiral galaxy and there are other galaxies but smaller okay so the whole, this thing is farther from other galaxies. So these are lumped together, if you will. That's why we call this the local group. Local group, all right? Local group. Um, so, Um, I'm trying to remember the distance between Andromeda and Milky Way. This is around uh, uh, three, let's say three million light years. I'm going to check this number, three million light years. Um, and if you think about the diameter of the local group itself, that's close to 10 uh, million light years. 10 million light years. Okay, so before I go any further, let me also double check the um, distance of Andromeda from us. I'm just gonna check it from the book. Uh, okay, Andromeda. Tut, tut, tut. Okay, a trip from the Milky Way to M31 would take 2.5 million years. Okay, I said three. The book says 2.5. Okay, that's uh, close enough. That's fine. All right. So it's that much, okay? So three or 2.5 million light years. All right, but then it doesn't stop there because the local group itself is part of a larger group. Okay, we call it a cluster now. Cluster. So, um, Virgo cluster is a cluster of galaxies. This is like thousands of galaxies. Okay, so this is the Virgo cluster. And now we're around, let's say, 50 million light years from that. 50 million light years from the 
Google cluster. So here's our local group. Local group. Okay? But there are more uh, groups in this cluster. So I don't know how to draw them. I'm just gonna put circles here. Okay? But the whole thing now is called a Virgo super cluster. Virgo super cluster. Now we're talking about a diameter uh, 120 or 110 million light years. Okay, that's big. And uh, some recent observations from 2015 or 14 shows us that actually Virgo supercluster is an extension of an even larger supercluster. Okay, I mean, they have different names. The names are important right now. It goes on and on. Okay, so where does it end? I mean, it gets bigger and bigger. Does it end anywhere? Um, now, there are some natural limits to what we can see in the sky. All right. Now, light, I said, has a fixed speed. It's a nature, constant of nature. But the universe had a beginning, okay? The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Billion years old. Therefore, uh, when light comes to your telescope or to your eye, it has traveled for a long time. Actually, the farther you look in space, you're looking farther back in time. Okay, so the, the farthest object is the oldest object. Think, think of it like this. All right. Now, the universe started at a point in time, let's say. I'm not going to say it started at a point in space. That's the wrong understanding. Big Bang is an explosion, ex explosion they say. But that doesn't give you the correct picture, unfortunately, okay? Because when you think of an explosion, you think of space, and then there's a bomb here. It explodes, the debris and shrapnels go in all directions. That's not how Big Bang happened. The Big Bang. That's the beginning of the universe. The Big Bang. Big, big Bang. Big Bang happened at all points, okay? Now, that, this is not from, the expansion of the universe is not from a point. All points, the points of space where stars are, are moving away from each other. Okay, so there is no center really for this expansion. Uh, to understand this, there are many analogies uh, given, okay, the most common there are two famous examples. The first one is a balloon, okay? You blow a balloon, and the two-dimensional surface of the balloon, if you put some marks, which would represent galaxy clusters, they're moving away from each other. So here's uh, the balloon, and then let's say there are three and four galaxies, and then now the balloon is much bigger, and all four points have moved away from each other. So you could be at any of those four points, the other three would be moving away from you, okay? That would not be the case if the explosion at the center in space, right? That's one example. Well, it's just an example though, because we our expansion happens in a 3D universe. The balloon is only two-dimensional, okay? So it's just to give you an understanding of how it works. But also you have to keep in mind that this expansion that happened 13.8, this explosion that happened 13.8 billion years ago, um, and continues today, the ex it's continuing to expand today, it doesn't change the distance between Andromeda and uh, the Milky Way, okay? Actually, they are going towards each other, not far away from each other. It's not like the local group is going away from Virgo. The expansion of the universe happens at a larger scale. So the clusters of clusters of galaxies if you look at the universe at that scale, there are thousands of them, millions of them. 
and those are moving away from each other. Okay? So, when you think of the expansion, um, there are things you have to consider. First of all, the idea of a distance between two clusters, now you have to define it. Now, until now, uh, a light year made sense. Okay, a light year is a distance, you know, traveled in one uh, year. Okay, I mean, between Earth and the Sun, it takes eight minutes, right? Light minutes, if you will. But if you think about the universe as a whole, and I mean the observable universe, the difference is there is no way to see anything beyond uh, that 13.8 billion light year limit. Okay, because those objects uh, will never be in my sight, okay? And also, one more thing to consider, uh, in the beginning, uh, the universe so, was so packed and light uh, couldn't go through it. So what we can see, the oldest thing we can see in the universe, which is also the farthest, it's not visible, but we can detect it with... Um, devices is the time when light was first created let's say okay we call it the cosmic background uh, radiation okay this was called discovered in the 60s uh, and that will be later than the actual the zero point in time doesn't matter roughly 13.8 billion years old objects is the farthest you can see okay so the observable uni universe is like a huge sphere around us in all directions, but there is universe beyond that as well, okay? And it's estimated that actually the actual universe, if not infinite, is at least a hundred times greater than the observable universe, all right? Now that's the observable universe, and uh, let's say this is the sphere and we are at the center of the sphere, we're looking around us, all we see is up to here, okay? Now what is this radius here? That's the question. R, or if you think in terms of diameters, D. This is the observable, observable universe. Now this, you can measure this, all right? You can measure this, but you gotta be very careful because the universe is expanding, you have to include that expansion. Now the light that reaches you at this instant from the very uh, perimeter here, from the side, left that object 13.8 billion years ago, or 13.7, okay, that, that many uh, years ago. And it's only reaching us now. So when I say the diameter of the observable universe, I'm talking about its size right now, okay? But that size has to be greater than 13.8 billion light years. Yes, the light traveled that much distance, but when it was traveling, the space was also being stretched, okay? That's what we call the expansion, the metric expansion, the expansion of the universe. It's not just galaxies are moving in space that's why they're going away from us no the space between us is also being stretched okay please make sure you understand this point think of it like the balloon okay or any elastic material okay let's think in one dimension let's say this is a, a platform but it's elastic i can i can stretch it and there's a person here who's gonna walk this direction, okay? And then we take a meter stick when he starts walking, we mark these points, zero, one, all the way to a hundred meters, okay? He's gonna walk all around, doesn't matter. But while he's doing this, somebody is pulling or stretching that uh, portion of the space that he's walking on. So by the time he reaches the 100 meter mark. We have stretched this to let's say 200 meters, okay? But remember, the markings on the on the platform are still there. 
So zero, one, two. And this here still says 100 meters. Okay, it's written there, but we know it's been stretched. The actual distance now is, what did I say, 200 meters? Okay, this is now 200 meters. When the stretch is completed, or let's say when the person has finished the uh, 100 meter line, the finish line, the distance is now 200 meters. But the actual distance he walked, because he was walking with a constant pace, all right, constant speed, is neither 100 nor 200, somewhere in between. Because, let's say, uh, he already uh, walked for a third of the path, okay? And the space, the, the, the platform, is being stretched. The parts that are being stretched, the parts that he finished, are also being stretched, we don't care about it, but the parts that he hasn't covered yet are being stretched, okay? So you may end up with three definitions of distance. The distance, which is 100 meters, that was the distance he was supposed to travel. He ended up 200 meters away, that's the second definition. And then the third definition is somewhere in between. If you know that uh, he walks, you know, uh, I don't know, um, 10 meters in 10 seconds, and okay, 32 seconds has passed, you can do the math and find the distance, which will be between 100 and 200 in this case, okay? So, keep that in mind. Your book, the textbook says, the observable universe has a radius of uh, 13 point uh, eight billion years. Let's double check that. The book says the observable, visible, visible means observable, visible universe, 13.8 billion light years. But they don't specify which definition. They actually, the third definition that I just explained, okay? But there are other definitions. So the diameter would be twice that number. You multiply this by two, you get a diameter. But you just go on Google and type, hey, what is the uh, diameter of the um, visible universe? Is it 13.8 uh, times 2, which is 27, uh, what is that, 27.6 billion light years? And then you say, oh, they say a different number, 92 or 93 billion. Go to Wikipedia or find the... Uh, YouTube video of a famous uh, physicist, okay, if you're curious, hey, what is the uh, diameter of the visible observable universe? Uh, they say 30, 92 billion light years. How so? My book says 27.6. Uh, well, both are correct in a way, okay? I mean, light indeed traveled that much distance, but while light was traveling all that distance, light, the photon, the light particle, the universe was being stretched. So the size of the visible universe now is 92 billion light years. We don't know what it was back then. Actually, I don't know, maybe it's... The calculations, of course, uh, I mean, uh, are there. I can remember the number. But in between, you have the uh, travel time, the, the distance based on the travel time, which is 13.8 billion years old, okay? That's all because the universe has a beginning that puts a natural limit around us, okay? And since this expansion is going on, and for the last 20 years or so, we know that the expansion is actually accelerating, okay? In the future, I'm not saying next year or in 10 years, I'm talking about millions of years from now, we won't even be able to see some part of the uh, those galaxies around us, okay? I mean, we can see them now, but in the future we won't be able to see them, okay? Uh, the farther you look in the universe, the older you see, but also they are uh, moving away from us with greater and greater speeds, called Hubble's Law, okay? And this was discovered in 1920s. So, a lot of stuff there, okay? A lot of stuff going on. But keep in mind, this stretch of the space, 
only happens if you look at the universe at a very large scale, cosmological scale. This doesn't, this expansion of the universe doesn't expand my pen, okay? I mean, on our level, solar system, galaxy, okay? The distances don't change. Actually, we have colliding galaxies. They, go, they move towards each other. But if you think of clusters or superclusters, clusters of clusters of galaxies at that scale, all of these are moving away from each other, no exception. And because there's no exception, there is no point where you can say, hey, that's the center of the universe. It's impossible to say. All points look identical as far as we know, okay? So because of this, there is no visible edge to the universe either. That's why I say the actual universe, if not infinite, is at least a hundred times greater than this observable universe. It can be infinite too. You know, we don't know. We know it had a beginning in the past, but it is possible that the universe itself is infinite. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I can't, I don't know any convincing uh, physical reason why it should be finite or infinite. I don't know. Okay, so it's actually beyond, some part of this is beyond physics, it's metaphysics. Okay, like questions like, what happened before Big Bang? Well, I mean, was there a time before Big Bang? We don't know. I mean, we, we count, we start our time, cosmological time, from Big Bang. That's time zero. Some people say, okay, there were other universes um, which died and ours was born. Or there were many, many universes, okay, multi-universes, parallel universes, which were all born at the same time, but they went in different directions. We have no way of finding out, all right? That's a natural limit on us. Um, we can't know more than that in 2021. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? All right, so uh, I'm going to finish it here. I hope this gave you an idea of uh, what size means and an idea of scales and how distances are measured in the universe, what light year is, what uh, parsec is. By the way, uh, I gave you the light year in uh, meters, but I didn't calculate it in terms of what? In terms of miles. Let's do that, huh? So where's that calculation here? So I calculated the light year in in meters or kilometers but I did not do it in let me zoom out a little bit in miles but you can convert it okay like right here over here so one light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15th meters let's convert this to uh, miles so let's take this number so one light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. What is it in miles? Now one mile is 1,609 meters. So we just divide it by this number, okay? So nine. Point, approximately 9.46 to the power 15 divided by 1609. This is 5.8, 5.9 times 10 to the 12th miles. Similarly, you can calculate the uh, speed of light in speed of light in miles per seconds c in miles per second what do you do you take that number and divide by 1609 so 299 792 divided by 1609 this is 186,322.2 miles per second uh, what about miles per hour? Miles per hour. And I'll leave that to you, okay? Calculate the uh, speed of light in miles per hour. 
The answer will be in the order of magnitude of 10 to the 8th again, 10 to the 8th uh, mph, miles per hour. All right, so I'm going to stop here. Until next time, goodbye.